So without any further delay, let me begin with our first session. So uh, the first session would be uh, focus on sixth generation of wireless communication. Uh, what is the basic reason behind that? Different potential technologies that we are going to employ and what are the potential candidate technologies that people are exploring in this domain? There are several challenges. Uh, what are they? And we will discuss each and every one step by step and what are the opportunities for the research? And at the end, we will also explore the role of artificial intelligence in sixth generation of wireless communication. So if I begin with an outline, uh, the key possibilities of sixth generation of wireless communication, we will discuss what kind of ambitious targets that people are targeting and what is intended out of that technology. Uh, we'll look at different design considerations and uh, potential technologies uh, for uh, sixth generation of wireless networks. Then we will explore terahertz communications, challenges and opportunities because we will be employing terahertz frequencies. There would be several challenges and opportunities. So we would be looking into that direction. Then we will explore the architecture of sixth generation and uh, what kind of constituents are there in the network of infrastructure of sixth generation that we will take a look. We will explore the role of machine learning and artificial intelligence in sixth generation and several emerging trends for research and technologies to be developed in sixth generation that people are exploring right now. We will have a bit touch upon on that. Then we will take a look at the applications and features of the sixth generation of wireless communication and several research opportunities that are existing right now can explore that we will take a look. So if I begin with the key possibilities of sixth generation of wireless communication, so the, key, the, the peak data rate, what is targeted for sixth generation is in the order of terabits per second, nearby greater than one terabits per second. So which is 100 times than that of fifth generation, what we you know we are going to support now. So we can see that it's a tremendous increase in the data rate, what we are going to support with sixth generation. The user that was a composite composite data rate. Now the user experience data rate that means one user how much data rate it's going to face, which is targeted in the order of one Gbps, so which is a nearby ten times than that of the fifth generation. That is also substantially higher what people are you know, targeting. Furthermore, we will be exploring terahertz range of the frequencies, which is starting from hundred gigahertz to ten terahertz. Right, so this range of frequencies, uh, this range is you know, very high and there are several challenges which are going to be faced that we have to address. Uh, the advantage is we will be sub able to support substantially or you know, tremendous uh, you know, data rates in terms of terabits per second at these higher frequencies. The spectrum efficiency what we target is uh, in the range of 5 to 10 times than that of fifth generation. Furthermore, a very high mobility has to be addressed because of the next generation of wireless networks. What, what people are expecting, expecting is a very high, uh, highly mobile uh, you know, atmosphere, which will be you know, up, up targeted in that you know, domain and uh, you know, very high speed networks used to be you know, addressed. Latency definitely when we target for high mobility, uh, the latency would be very low and uh, that should be in the order of 10 to 100 microseconds. Uh, and the connectivity density, what we focus is uh, nearby, you know, at least you know, higher than 10 times higher than the fifth generation of wireless communication and energy efficiency also is required to be high, at least 10 to, 10 to 100 times higher than fifth generation of technology. Substantially high throughput and network capacity is targeted. Uh, with enhanced security, uh, the objective is to support the ubiquitous connectivity also so that all the segments of the network can be connected together and we have a complete integration of AI to support the ubiquitous connectivity. So this kind of ambitious uh, key possibilities are available with sixth generation of wireless technologies or wireless networks that are targeted by 2030, uh, that is ITM 2030, what you know, we, we have in mind. Now, if I present a brief comparison of sixth generation of wireless communication with 4G and 5G. So if I take a look at 4G, the support for terahertz 
frequencies is nil because the current range of frequencies supported by 4G is in the band of 2.4 gigahertz slash 5 gigahertz. Whereas in fifth generation, there would be a marginal support. It would start at 28 gigahertz. So from that onwards, people can extend it a bit more to above, above 30 gigahertz. So marginal support would be there towards the RS communication, but not in a full fledged. Whereas in sixth generation, we can see uh, we would be supporting uh, the frequencies in the range of 0.1 terahertz to no, 100 tera, 0.1 terahertz to 10 terahertz, which is substantially high. The second one is the integration of artificial intelligence, machine learning or deep learning is almost next to nil for fourth generation. Whereas in fifth generation, the support for AI is marginal and sixth generation is targeted with a complete integration of AI. So these are the two major differences between 4G, 5G and 6G. Now, if I present a frequency band, our frequency spectrum, what we have here is uh, currently we are here nearby this region, which is around six gigahertz or maybe sub six gigahertz frequencies. So we can say five gigahertz frequencies for 4G LTE. So currently we are located at this region. Now for 5G, we will be transmitting here at this domain nearby 30 gigahertz, or we can say around 28 gigahertz. That's the targeted frequency for fifth generation. However, for Sixth generation, what we want to explore is beyond 100 gigahertz, beyond 100 gigahertz to in terms of 10, towards 10 terahertz. So the first band, because of the hardware availability, because it's very difficult to develop the hardware components at very high frequencies. So the first band, what people are targeting is from 100 gigahertz onwards to maybe you know, nearby 3 terahertz. So initial de development could be in terms of uh, no frequencies nearby 100 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz or nearby that range, we will have some first set of equipments to support terah terahertz communication. So this is the band what people are targeting. Now, a very a quick question comes here. Here is generally this frequency may not be that much of harmful to the human body cells because we can see that X-ray frequencies and a gamma rays frequencies, which are in the range of 10 power 15 to 10 power 18 respectively, right? They would be damaging uh, human body cells. So this could be under study for the you know, damage on the human body cells behavior for terahertz communication. So this is the first range of frequencies what we are targeting. So if I put it in terms of wavelength, this would be in the range of 0.03 to 3 mm range and uh, sub millimeter wave radiation would be there. So it's equivalent to 0.1 to 10 terahertz if someone is looking into that. Uh, lower terahertz band, uh, first we will target from nearby 250 gigahertz or 275 gigahertz to 3 terahertz. Gig, 3 terahertz. Why we will see in a shorter duration that this is the first band which we want to target for our transmission, right? And the key possibility is using this terahertz frequencies, we can achieve very high data rates, tremendous high data rates in terms of terahertz that in terms of terabits per second that we can achieve. And there would be there would be a trouble of path loss because as we know that higher the frequency, higher is the path loss. That means we will not be able to transmit our signal for a longer distance. So if we transmit our signal at terahertz frequencies, we will not be able to transmit at a for, for a longer distance. That's the dis disadvantage of terahertz frequencies, sir. Right. And uh, it would be having a super shorter distance compared to compared to 4G and 5G. That is the disadvantage of terahertz frequencies. So this can be uh, overcome uh, this by uh, using uh, beam forming antennas, which can you know, penetrate uh, our waves with a higher gain across this path losses, right? And can compensate the path losses caused by the higher frequencies. So that is the advantage uh, of the beam forming antenna that uh, furthermore, the higher frequencies will be you know, or could be blocked by buildings so easily so that they will lose their intensity over a longer distance. That is another disadvantage. Uh, that means wider coverage would be definitely a challenge and we may end up uh, deploying more number of towers uh, with uh, highly directional or pencil beam forming antennas to compensate the higher 
losses. Uh, furthermore, uh, to improve the spectrum efficiencies at terahertz uh, communication, we will definitely continue the technology what we are using currently. That that would be the extension of MIMO or massive MIMO, a super massive MIMO for sixth generation to to increase the spectrum efficiency, to increase the performance, to increase the three throughput and other things. Now, first challenge what we face is atmospheric attenuation or atmospheric absorption for terahertz communication. So if you look at this curve of atmospheric attenuation, which is presented in dB per kilometer, versus the carrier frequency. As the frequency increases, overall atmospheric attenuation goes higher. So currently we can see we are at sub 6 gigahertz frequencies, or you can say even for 28 gigahertz of frequencies for 5G, the atmospheric attenuation is not playing that much of higher role. Whereas when we move 100 gigahertz and onwards, atmospheric attenuation goes substantially high and it will try to deteriorate or degrade our signal. That means we will not be able to receive the signal with a higher signal to noise ratio or not, and that will eventually end up losing our BER and we may not be able to deliver the our desired uh, this uh, quality of services. So that would be a major trouble and that is mainly occurring because of the scattering issues, me scattering because it's more uh, severe at higher frequency than at a lower frequency. So that's the bottleneck, that's the first bottleneck. Second, another major issue what we will face is the rain attenuation for terahertz communication. So if you look at this curve, uh, generally the rain attenuation is will create a seasonal impact. So generally it would be in the range of, let's say if you have a moderate rainfall of 25 mm per hour, we would be facing nearby 10 dB per kilometer of rain that is at the you know, frequencies 100 gigahertz and onwards. So you can see the rain attenuation is very high and to compensate this rain attenuation, we will need uh, additional antenna gain with more number of array elements uh, with adaptive beam steering uh, sort of capabilities. So that's the only way to compensate it. But furthermore, if there is a heavy rain, even beyond this, the losses would become more severe and we may lose the connectivity. That's one trouble. And uh, to overcome this these things, uh, there are two solutions, either I mean, two solutions, uh, transmit higher power uh, to, and uh, employ the beam farming antenna. So these are the two major solutions what we, what we will have. There is one more trouble. There is one more trouble what we are going to face is uh, surface scattering for terahertz communication. So if you look at this, most of the you know, lower frequency signals, uh, uh, they are the most of the surfaces they appear smoother at microwave frequencies. That could be minor specular scattering, but not kind of a you know, major trouble. Whereas when we use, uh, let's say, visible light or uh, visible visible light or infrared frequencies, uh, it could be even more severe. And for terahertz. And there is a significant diffuse scattering and a you know, strong specular, specular reflections. So, so this would be another trouble which will degrade our signal quality that we have to address. The next trouble is the partition and penetration losses. Uh, this partition and penetration losses are substantially high as the frequency increases. So if you look at this, uh, as the frequency increases, so such as let's say 28 gigahertz is for 5G when we go to 140 gigahertz, that is the starting frequency for 6G. The attenuations will be increasing again as the frequency increases. So higher is the frequency, higher is the attenuation. That's the major trouble, correct? And again, it depends on the thickness of the material also. Uh, when we have a larger thickness, we will be seeing the larger attenuation. So if you look at this, uh, if I just take a glass, for clear glass or glass wall, we will be seeing 15 to 26 dB of attenuation based on what frequency we employ and based on what the thickness of the material is. Similarly, we can see if I take a solid wood uh, for that wooden material, it would be 0.25 to 0.75 thickness and at terahertz frequencies, we're going to face around 14 to 26 dB attenuation, 14 to 26 dB of attenuation. That's very high. That's very high. Similarly, for plastic and paper, for similarly for plastic and paper, 
again we will be uh, seeing very larger large attenuations at higher frequencies now this will directly impact our signal to noise ratio because uh, higher is the path uh, higher is the penetration loss uh, we will not be able to deliver the signal with higher strength higher signal strength and that would result in a uh, lower signal to noise ratio because signal strength is getting degraded as we are increasing the frequency so that's the major trouble these two curves uh, are indicative curves to understand how the path loss is impacting the signal and what would be the received power as we go larger on the distance or higher on the frequency side. So if you look at this first curve at the left hand side is the path loss versus trans receiver distance. So as the trans receiver distance increase, increase, right, uh, the path losses are getting increased. Now. Uh, this is a trans receiver separation that means the distance between between a transmitter and a receiver this is called a trans receiver tr separation that means the distance between a transmitter and a receiver so as the distance between a transmitter and receiver is increasing definitely larger is the distance larger is the path loss so the path loss would be increasing that is the general trend furthermore we can see for 28 gigahertz, we have a lower path loss. When we increase frequency to 73 gigahertz, we got an increased path loss further. When we go even beyond this to 140 gigahertz, we get further more increase in the path loss. We haven't started even for terahertz, I mean, one terahertz or like that. See, uh, here we are just at 140 gigahertz, just the beginning point for sixth generation. So now as we proceed further, and we increase the path loss, increase this transistor, increase the frequency further, we will be facing larger path losses even beyond this. Now, that's a major trouble and that we have to overcome through highly directional antennas and through other technologies. Similarly, if I see the curve for received power at a receiver versus transceiver separation, so the general trend is as the distance increases, as the distance increases, received power would be decreasing because the path loss is higher. So this received power is exactly inversely proportional to the path loss because higher the path loss, more, more of the signal strength would be lost here and we would be receiving lesser power here. If I present the intuition behind this is, uh, is this the basic formula of the path loss? which includes the first component of free space path loss, which is directly dependent on the frequency and is directly proportional to the distance. So as I increase the frequency here, this is a free space path loss formula. Yes, as I increase the frequency here, free space path loss goes higher. That will come here and constitute becomes a constitution of I mean, constituents of my path loss formula. Higher the frequency, higher is the free space path loss. Subsequently, it also depends on the distance, what we have just seen in the previous two graphs. Higher the distance, higher is the path loss because as the distance increases, path loss will also go higher. And third component is atmospheric attenuation, which would, uh, which would, which would be nearby one to three dB of you know, penalty for 200 to 300 gigahertz. Additional penalty would be measured, uh, would be budgeted here to support. Uh, to support my transmission and uh, similarly if there are other components such as let's say shadowing effect we will see that can also be budgeted as an additional penalty in the path loss formula so now there is one more minor trouble not a bigger one but minor trouble we can see that would be a human blockage model also so that would be a shadowing impact because of the human blockage right that could be a temporal shadowing loss so whenever let's say we are transmitting and if a narrow beam antenna is used and if you let's say if you if, if the shadowing occurs because of the human blockage there would be a dip of around 7 to 8 dB of SNR we can see that's a substantial dip and that would degrade my signal to noise ratio and we will be seeing a dip in the BER that's also substantial so we have to we have to plan these things and accordingly we have to budget the things right so uh, furthermore if i just summarize the first segment uh, which is nothing but a channel modeling and capacity analysis so first we have to develop a novel channel model uh, or we have to budget all these factors in uh, 
such as atmospheric attenuation, rain attenuation, path loss, partition losses, penetration losses, human blockages, and uh, other things we have to budget and plan our transmission accordingly with a, with, a, with a novel channel model to support the terahertz communication. That's the first building block. The channel capacity for terahertz uh, that needs to be investigated with novel path loss model and uh, for to overcome this we need uh, you know, several novel power allocation algorithms to overcome this kind of higher losses uh, what we just discussed and uh, different radio access schemes which is which are required you know as a part of the development now for a shorter propagation distance uh, the advantage is we will be seeing very high data rates at terahertz communication so which is uh, you know, which is very suitable for the nano networks so where we do not transmit for a longer distance and uh, the range of communication is shorter and uh, this terahertz communication is you know, substantially helping with the nano networks and other things but the problem is when uh, we have a longer distance we will need a directional antenna highly beam forming antennas or pencil beams uh, to overcome the path loss for, for path losses and other losses what we, other troubles and losses what we have just discussed uh bifriction effect at terahertz frequency is not that much of prominent but the scattering uh, is difficult so scattering may create a lot of troubles at terahertz frequencies that we have to keep it in mind so that was the first segment of the talk which covered uh, about the you know troubles at the, the terahertz communication the opportunities and key possibilities behind the sixth generation and terahertz communication now we will take a look at the architecture of sixth generation that how would it look like right so generally the wider architecture of terahertz communication is is nothing but the coverage of space air ground and underwater networks together so all the segments of my uh, communication network uh, they are coming together and working under a same umbrella from framing a ubiqu framing a ubiquitous connectivity so that we can roll across any of the segment easily and take the advantage of uh, each other right so the terahertz communication is intended to be integrated with the satellite communication uh, the air network terrestrial and underwater network and this would be this is how it would be looking like that terahertz communication so the terrestrial part which would be the the main the main part which we are you know, running across right now that would be running at the terahertz frequencies that is the first segment and uh, the satellite communication would be a space network and then the airborne network furthermore we if you have underwater communication segments they are also expected to be integrated in the same umbrella under the same umbrella framing and ubiquitous connectivity right so if i if i look at the ubiquitous intelligent mobile society that means there are different applications and different segments such as let's say IoT segment, uh, service as uh, sensing as a service segment, environmental modeling, uh, remote sensing, smart home applications, human computer interaction, vehicle for everything. There are a few segments on optical wireless communication or optical fiber cable communications. Uh, there are a few segments on, let's say, on uh, maybe uh, satellite communication. Or there are a few segments on. You know, wireless uh, no, passive passive optical networks all these things have to come across under a single umbrella and frame an ubiquitous intelligent mobile society so right that's the you know, idea behind this kind of you know future research so if i look at the potential technologies now what we what people are targeting right now is to establish a test bed on sixth generation of the communication you employing the terahertz terahertz frequencies right so to establish sixth generation of test bed employing terahertz uh, frequencies so this is a bit challenging because right now the hardware support is very limited at terahertz communication because uh, the hardware support the, the the hardware equipments they are they have to operate at that much of higher frequency with high speeching, switching capabilities so that is the first bottleneck uh, the next upcoming technology uh, no, is a full integration of ai with the capability of big big data analytics is also expected as a route and uh, furthermore, what we need is a novel radio access technology for sixth generation, uh, such as let's say so far what we what we are using is OFDM, uh, various version of OFDM, NOMA, some sort of things, right? So same would be expected in sixth generation also, maybe the hybrid version of NOMA, NOMA OFDM sort of things, or people are exploring new versions or new technologies for radio access 
required for sixth generation to enhance the capabilities, massive connectivities, reduce the power consumption, improve the spectrum utilization, and other things, right? Uh, to increase the throughput and uh, increase the spectrum efficiency, uh, supermassive MIMO, which is nothing but the multiple inputs, multiple outputs, is another technology what we are exploring or you know, we will be exploring in sixth generation also. Uh, there is one more wing of communication that is called uh, visible light communication, right? Visible light communi communication, or it could be free space optical communication using uh, laser sources. That is also one segment for sixth generation can be integrated, right? So this is also a research opportunity, which uh, these two are the research opportunities which people are exploring these days. Uh, in future, uh, maybe you know, down the line, maybe 10 years, quantum communication is also looking very you know, attractive to increase the transmission capabilities by you know, employing the qubits uh, instead of having the traditional bits one and zero, right? So this is co quantum communication and computing is also an uh, attractive field for the researchers these days. Uh, there are several new things such as, let's say, orbital angular momentum based multiplexing, OAM multiplexing, right? So this will also open up a new era of modulation and multiplexing. Uh, we will discuss in a while uh, to increase the, the spectrum utilization and capabilities, other things, right? And uh, energy and we definitely energy is a bottleneck for this kind of complex network. So energy and spectrum efficiency is also important. So to do that, we need advanced hardwares and uh, resource allocation me mechanisms to improve the energy and spectrum efficiency. So these are the bottlenecks. Uh, these are the research opportunities which people are exploring these takes. This, this, there are a few more such as, let's say, holographic beam forming. Uh, this is also an attractive solution as a replacement for the traditional relaying system, which is nothing but the reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, right? This is this is something also coming uh, nicely. And uh, one more thing is to cut down the uh, expenses on the physical infrastructure, dynamic network slicing, what people used to, what network vendors or service providers used to employ, where let's say we have a network infrastructure de deploy, deployed combinedly and uh, multiple vendors come across and uh, deploy them, come deploy network infrastructure combinedly and slice them and then provide the services. So this could, this is also another good idea. Molecular communication, semantic communication. This is also catching up these days. Uh, currently what we transmit is the complete information. Whereas in semantic communication, instead of transmitting a complete, complete inf information, we focus on the semantic part of the communication of the information and cut down the you know, larger occupied bandwidths. So this is also something uh, acting as a research uh, no, direction. Uh, UAV is UAV and uh, no, is also another good field uh, to explore. So this where the, you know, some of the technology is what we are expecting or some of the research opportunities what we are looking for. If you look at the, some of the applications and features of sixth generation uh, to accomplishing this objective is what we have said, higher data rates, low latency, higher energy efficiency, spectrum efficiency, and so on, what we discussed just now in the couple of slides in the beginning. Uh, the application says like using this AI, ML, and DL, we can achieve this, this all very nicely in an automated way with zero human touch or maybe limited human touch, uh, correct? So the next is AR, VR is also picking up virtual or augmented reality, or maybe such as metaverse is also picking up as an application, IONT, uh, Internet of Nano Things is also coming up very nicely with sixth generation because they don't need that much of longer trans longer distance transmission. So where terahertz frequencies can support substantial high data rates for IoT networks, tactile and haptic communication. These two are something which is a next two version could be employed in the metaverse or beyond that, where we can, you know, uh, transmit some sort of. Uh, along with you know, information, we can transmit some sort of you know, real time experiences also. So this kind of applications are you know, very useful. Uh, blockchain is also coming up nicely along with the machine learning because there are certain disadvantages of the machine learning uh, which can be overcome using the blockchain. 
which can be overcome using the blockchain and there are certain disadvantages of blockchain which can be overcome using uh, machine learning so they can complement each other we will see in the next lecture uh, very nicely uh, self free communication is also another one because you know, now the idea is to move on from the self based network to self free uh, network and you know, provide a seamless connectivity there are several other applications such as healthcare and telemedicine applications which people are exploring these days using terahertz communication uh, there are several emerging trends right now what we are seeing that uh, first one is we want to expand the coverage that is the major thing how we do that uh, by integrating several segments such as let's say satellite communication optical fiber communication underwater communication visible light communication segments along with the sixth generation of terahertz communication right so that's the way of expanding the coverage another one is to increase the system capability this can be come up uh, this can be covered up using several solutions such as let's say uh, new resource allocation or new resource modulations or uh, new new modulation schemes or maybe you know, new uh, uh, technologies uh, other things we can we can do that and then uh, we have to add a new capability using integration of the ai uh, and uh, no what not i mean uh, people are exploring too many other directions let's say you know deep learning machine learning uh, federated learning there are too many you know deep learning algorithms so transfer learning is also the best one coming out these days to you know increase the network efficiency in, in a de decentralized way so let me uh, you know give the first idea to improve the uh, coverage so if you look at the expanding the coverage so the bottleneck for this terahertz communication is we may not be able to transmit for a longer distance we may end up deploying too many base stations or smaller access points to cover up the distance and which may not be feasible the network deployment cost may be very high to overcome this problem wherever we cannot deploy sixth generation base stations or smaller access points we can integrate that with satellite communication and provide the seamless connectivity now the problem with satellite communication is it takes very long I mean, very large transmission delay, whereas in sixth generation runs at terahertz frequencies and uh, which is expected to take least delay. So now that that sink in delay would be a major bottleneck between these two integrations that we have to address. That is an that is an open research problem for an integration part. Or one can think about just the integration part. How are we going to integrate both the technologies so that we can operate seamlessly? So that's kind of one thing what we have to address uh, if you look at this you know both the system generally in the past they are independent right satellite communication and mobile communication systems and both of them were 2d but now we have to integrate because everything should come under a same umbrella and then they have to operate uh, nicely so that we can provide a seamless connectivity and through the integrated through the integrated technology right so that's why we need a 3d core and that's why we need ai to integrate all the segments and operate it uh, you know, with a zero human touch so with aforementioned you know, objectives what we have discussed now see there are new resource utilization methods uh, and uh, we have two large spectrum so we have to overcome we have to come up with new resource utilization methods because Right now we got two large spectrums one is from 0.1 terahertz to 10 terahertz and another one is from let's say 400 terahertz to 800 terahertz that is the visible light spectrum which is mainly for led bulbs right what we i mean they are very you know attractive they are low power consuming elements and you can you can have very high speed data connectivity uh, across this visible light band so this is one something you know is coming up this is mainly used for you know very attractive and mainly used for indoor communication to establish very high speed connectivity uh this is anyway suitable for indoor outdoor both of them uh, here the trouble is we need a line of sight that's the only trouble with visible light communication band right so that that is something we have to uh, you know, take care but these two are the bands unified bands what we have right now now so far if you look at this uh 
baseband signal has to be brought up to the higher frequency. So generally the traditional or solid state terahertz communication system, the traditional systems, generally what we do use the frequency mixing mechanism. So lower frequency can, uh, lower frequency signal can be translated to the higher frequency signals, right? Uh, using multiple frequency mixtures, but that is very costly. So we have to come up with something special direct modulation terahertz communication system where which will be able to modulate the baseband signal directly to the terahertz wave, right? That is something we have to overcome and you know develop a system which can give a direct access to the terahertz communication. Uh, there is one more idea. Uh, so this all are the different research ideas what we are presenting today. There is one more idea is to establish the beam forming uh, elements or beam forming you know, antenna. So here we can see this meta material based you no know, meta surface meta surface based antennas they are very attractive uh, they can easily convert my spherical waves the feeder antennas outcome into the multiple beams for a transmission so now these beams can be adjusted and control controlled through ai through meta surfaces right and uh, at the receiver side you can see we can uh, catch those beams and then we can focus them and receive the signal so Generally, the traditional antennas, which were meta surface, ba meta surface lens based antennas, uh, they act as a phase shifting structure, uh, which is applied to the signal uh, and uh, it will radiate from an antenna array. So this was our traditional idea and uh, it can adjust the beam direction by applying the DC bias to its constituting element. But for each, we need, a, we, we need this phase shifting structure. And because of that, it becomes very bulky. Whereas if we use meta material based antenna, so if you, if you use meta material based antenna, which will act as a resonant antenna to radiate the attractive beam by itself, right? So if we, we can look at this, it can radiate my wave as per my uh, you know, desired in, in, the, in, in the desired direction, correct? So in contrast to the you know, meta surface lens based antenna, so the structure becomes very easier. Furthermore, we can employ MIMO based configuration through beam forming. So this is even more simplified. Multiple beams can form a MIMO based structure here. So we can look at this. This is also one more research opportunity which people are exploring these days, right? Now there are several research opportunities and challenges for terahertz communication. First one, if someone is in the hardware, uh, it's an open field to develop high frequency hardware components. Second, we can develop terahertz communication uh, and channel model estimation, other things, uh, the this traditional theory for communication that we have to develop. Directional networking for terahertz communication, uh, terahertz wireless communication, what people are exploring these days. This is also something coming as a hot topic. There are several methods which needs to be uh, de developed for bandwidth enhancements. Uh, for that, we can, uh, for enhanced spectrum utilization, we can always look for MIMO. Uh, no, that is that is the supermassive MIMO or massive MIMO, that kind of method, which will not only improve the you know, spectrum utilization, but also improve the throughput or performance of the system. And this can also be done through VLC or maybe optical fiber, optical, you know, wireless optical networks also. Uh, furthermore, we need intelligent dynamic spectrum access because the connection density, with connection density, uh, so connectivity, I mean, there would be a lot of, lot, lot many users you want to, access the spectrum there will be too many users who want to access the spectrum so we need to be intelligent and dynamic uh, in allocating the spectrums in such so that we can improve uh, the spectrum access uh, for that the cognitive radio for intelligent spectrum sharing is the you know, best idea which people are exploring these days to share the spectrum by utilizing this spectrum sensing and interference management methods to improve the system performance so that is for the more uh, intelligent symbiotic radio that is also looking promising for sixth generation. Uh, the symbiotic radio, that means several heterogeneous wireless communication systems, they uh, intelligently cooperate with each other and uh, try to realize the mutual benefits for transmission uh, and uh, for efficient resource sharing, right? So generally SR aims to enhance the performance of the communication system uh, through the intelligent inter subsystem cooperation. So this, these are some of the ideas what people are exploring uh, as their research.
the next research idea so we are pitching out different research ideas and opportunities what people can explore in this sixth generation of wireless communication so if someone is looking to pick up any this could act as a act as a pointer and then one can go and explore in an uh, in a direction which they are interested in so next one is uh, the integrated wireless information and energy transfer wiet so so far the information signals are just used to receive uh, the information uh, the electromagnetic waves what we receive it through which we receive the signal uh, information and then we never use it for energy transfer so now the idea is to use those uh, wireless information uh, I mean those uh, waves for wireless information and energy transfer simultaneously. So we receive the energy, we receive the information, and through these waves, we receive the energy and store it in the batteries or a charging device, which can pump in to the low power consuming devices for for a communication also. Right. So this is also something you know very interesting field, uh, such as let's say energy harvesting mechanisms. Uh, through this WIET, so these people are people are also exploring in that particular direction. Next set of technology is a reconfigurable intelligent surface, right? So this is something acting as a, a perfect replacement for traditional relaying systems such as amplify and forward, decode and forward to enhance the performance. Now, what is RIS? RIS is known as reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. So here, uh, the RIS, uh, which is, which can, it is nothing but the artificial surface made up of the electromagnetic materials that can change the property of the electromagnetic waves. So let's say if I'm hitting the signal here, my this electromagnetic wave, this RIS elements, they can change the property of it. So let's say they can amplify the signal and they can transmit it, right? Or they can change the phase and they can direct it, direct it in a specific direction of my desired user right so by this i can improve my signal to noise ratio correct so and furthermore this can be completely integrated with deep learning methodology right so it can be auto automatically operated without you know, any human intervention so our traditional relaying system such as let's say amplify and forward uh decode and forward uh, correct so this this relaying system they take they consume a lot of power that's the disadvantage. Whereas, whereas these are passive, these are these elements, this RIS is passive. It can easily be pasted on the building. So deployment cost is lower, plus the overall cost of RIS is also lower. And uh, they are substantially energy efficient and cost effective, right? So this is something also coming up in the future. Uh, so if someone is looking in that direction to explore, that is also a nice direction. Uh, the next one to improve, uh, or to enable the massive connect to improve these you know, spectrum efficiency to improve uh, the throughput to improve the energy efficiency to reduce the latency correct the MIMO advanced version of MIMO such as let's say super massive MIMO with large number of array antenna, antenna elements uh, can be deployed with sixth generation uh, to accomplish the aforementioned objectives, that is also one sort of research problem which people are targeting these days. So if someone is looking in that direction, that is also acting as a, as a pointer that will substantially help us to improve the spectrum efficiency to uh, achieve uh, through this spatial multiplexing, uh, large, uh, larger energy efficiency, larger throughput. Uh, it would be you know reducing the latency what not i mean this is this has already been tested in 4g 5g so definitely the advanced version of mimo will go and support for sixth generation also uh, the next research opportunity what people are exploring these days is since we said ubiquitous connectivity that means there are multiple segments such as let's say rf and non-rf segment such as as we said we want to combine let's say satellite communication and rf i mean satellite communication and terrestrial networks so here the integration part becomes difficult right so integration part uh, becomes difficult here uh, we have to combine both the segments and for that uh, the transition between one technology to another technology and make them compatible and talking to each other is interoperability is very difficult so this can the transition part can act as one research problem 
where people can explore, let's say, RF and optical systems. So let's say my terrestrial seg segments on run is running on terahertz. My backbone segment is running on optical fiber cables. So now both the technologies are different. So I have to migrate from terahertz to the optical uh, domain or vice versa. And then that could be one research problem to facilitate the transition. Similarly, let's say satellite and you know, terahertz communication on a terra segment, uh, on, a, on a terrestrial segment. So we have to migrate and migrate from one segment of technology to the another segment of technology and then provide uh, seamless connectivity. So this are acting as a research problem, right? Now, furthermore, what people are exploring is a new resource modulation scheme. So this new resource modulation scheme is you know, one potential candidate is orbital angular momentum based technology. So, so far, whatever the foundation of the current wireless communication system, I definitely it will go on the optical laser sources. So, which, which would mean that we will be requiring free space optical communication segment. And uh, you know, there are, I mean, generally they go with the traditional plane uh, and uh, you know, whereas the generally the electromagnetic waves, they are not only having the linear momentum but they will also have the angular momentum. So they circulate around the ax and then they pro propagate, right? So now we can make this angular momentum as an element for multiplexing. So which can result in orbital angular momentum based multiplexing, which uh, allows us to uh, multiplex different uh, wave fronts with different helical phases. So each phase can act as one multiplexing element and then we can multiplex them please note that the frequency or wavelength could be same but it they will they will be operated at a at a different helical phase so that will open up a new multiplexing domain right for those om modes and each signal is also known as om mode right so this will this om modes are generally orthogonal with each other and we can multiplex and demultiplex them together this would act as a new way of capacity enhancement for sixth generation and beyond sixth generation of wireless communication even right uh, there are certain problems with this first one we may need line of sight communication so that's why we might have to integrate over the uh, free space optical communication or maybe other segments and uh, the problem is because of the the line of sight communication if it is disturbed then we may end up losing uh, losing the alignment and we may, we may because it's very sensitive to the alignment so that we may lose the connectivity second one is the beam divergence uh, that could be the trouble and third one is because of the optical segment again we have to transit from optical to terahertz whenever we move towards the uh, terahertz part right so now the idea behind this is this is to multiplex so let's say i, I get multiple modes Right, so multiple modes at different angles or phases or helical phases, they would be multiplexed together, and then we can transmit them here. So this 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 is a very this is framing a very attractive application. So let's say this kind of a mode domain multiple access scheme, mode domain multiple access scheme. So let's say if I'm transmitting a specific mode in a specific direction for a specific user. Right. So this could be acting as, let's say, giving me a large you know, possibility for uh, you know, multiple waves are multiplexed at different angle. Now, the problem is line of sight is another trouble. So the, the application would be you know, looking very vast, but it could be limited at some point of time. That could be an open research problem for this type of you know, idea so that we have to explore. The next technology uh, would be integrated along with this is uh, the optical wireless communication. So generally, for metro network or for metro cities, there are you no know, multi-story buildings, right? So at the top of the building, we can deploy free space optical free space optical communication devices, such as let's say laser sources and receivers. They can be aligned at the top roof of the building, and we can light up uh, substantially, you know, high speed communication. One such application is let's say data center interconnect. Uh, for this kind of content providers uh, so they can just go in and deploy the laser trans receivers or maybe laser sources and receivers uh, so that they can establish the high speed uh, 
inter, uh, inter high speed connectivity between two data centers and they can sync up the content for what is being stored in their data center very easily right this is one uh, possibility on optical wireless communication the second possibility is on the visible light communication which is suitable for the indoor communication where led light sources can uh, feed the data towards the indoor uh, internet usage in, indoor internet applications right so that is a li-fi sort of thing what people are exploring these days it can be you know applied to the road safety also when let's say all the cars are moving in the same you know land then they can have you know, line of sight communication and then road for road safety it can you know, enhance the communication part there are several other things that optical wireless communication can act it can be a hybrid version of the with of with a wife rf segment also so let's say one segment could be optical based on optical one segment could be based on rf right so they can interoperate and provide the, the transitions between them furthermore we can frame mimo sort of things also using this kind of technology so simo mimo different kind of things we can we can uh, do them here right uh, the next phase uh, of the research what people are exploring right now is for the current communication for the current communication we use the traditional bits one and zero we use the traditional bits one and zero whereas the future what people are seeing and thinking is in terms of quantum communication where uh, the information is encoded in terms of quantum states using uh, photons or the quantum uh, particles by superimposing both the bits into a qubit so eventually it will end up consuming half the bandwidth than what we consume with the traditional bits so substantially it will improve the spectrum efficiency that's the idea here furthermore uh, this superimposition of the of the you know states quantum states they are irreversible that's so why that's why they are you know very difficult to temper and you know, generally they cannot be accessed or cloned without tempering uh, because of the quantum principles such as correlation of entanglement of the particles uh, right and uh, because of that the security is substantially high with this technology and it improves the data rate as we said it will you know, transmit the qubits compared to the traditional bits uh, there are some research going on, such as let's say quantum Q distribution, quantum teleportation, quantum secure direct communication. What people are exploring under this umbrella that we can look forward and do that. Uh, there is a huge potential for long distance communication, but we need the uh, quantum repeaters for that. For that, so this is also something. What is people are looking into that to establish the long distance communication using the quantum part, right? The third phase of the talk, which would take another 20 minutes, there we would address the role of uh, machine learning in sixth generation of wireless communication. Now, as we said, the network architecture is you know, super complex. And uh, when we are looking for, let's say, ubiquitous connectivity, the human intervention is next to impossible. We cannot manage the resources, allocation, other things manually because it's very complex. So that's why. AI's role, it could be machine learning, deep learning, any of those. AI's role is very important in resource management for future wireless networks, right? So that's why, you know, this without AI, this won't be there. So that's why the complete integration of AI is very important. So generally, if I say, you know, types of machine learning, there are three major types. One is we will take a look a bit more detail in the next session, uh, but I'll give you a brief here. So generally, there are three major types of machine learning. One is supervised learning. Another is unsupervised learning. And third one is the reinforcement learning. Correct. So generally, uh, you know, we use for classification and regression. And these are some of the algorithms such as, let's say, linear regression, logistic regression, uh, KNN, random forest, naive paste. Uh, sometimes we use a convolution neural networks also sometimes we, we use the deep neural networks also along with them and then uh, in unsupervised we used to use uh, k-means clustering uh, principal component analysis deep lift network deep boltzmann machine auto encoders etc uh, in reinforcement learning uh, we used to use q learning we'll see you know each of them step by step some of the applications we'll see deep q learning uh, and you know, there are a few more right so which are generally the objective based objective based correct so 
these algorithms, uh, people are exploring each algorithm and uh, looking at how it works. Some of them are also looking at along with the game theory that how it works along that game theory and something. So what is resource, right? So generally the resource could be here, the frequency, it could be the power allocation, it could be the spectrum allocation, which is a part of the frequency allocation, correct? So there are several resources that we have to allocate. So uh, AI for resource allocation problems. So here, if we apply supervised and unsupervised machine learning, the problem is obtaining the high quality training data sets for wireless communication or wireless networks is difficult. That is the, the biggest problem what we are facing it, right? So generally what we do is we apply the deep learning algorithms for classification, regulation, and then perform the deep learning, correct? But uh, there are troubles with the data sets. Data sets are not so easily available. They're not so accurate. So that is one more trouble what we are facing. Uh, to stay light on it, uh, people are also explore reinforcement learning where reinforcement algorithms, they are suitable for making the decisions on resource allocation. Why? Because you know, they will interact with the existing you know, environment and they will learn some of the action based on the rewards or penalties. And then they will modify it continuously. So such as the queue learning, it will store the experiences in queue table. Correct. So it will take one resource allocation action and then it will store uh the experience that how that how that went and then you know what was the reward did it go well how was the be or how was the signal to noise ratio was it good was it bad and based on that it will continue that kind of actions but the problem with this queue learning is when we have too many services to be served a queue table grows exponentially so that will load on the memory so that's the you know that's the trouble with this sometimes people use deep reinforcement learning which is nothing but the hybrid version of the reinforcement learning and deep learning uh, which will combine the advantages of deep learning and reinforcement learning so this is how people are looking at one more very good application for uh, wireless communication or sixth generation of communication is the application of the transfer learning so this is something very nice because let's say when we have similar segments, smaller segments of wireless communication uh, where we need to uh, employ the resource allocation. So the transfer learning, the basic idea says, let's say learn the model from the target domain, right? So, I mean, take acquire the model from the target domain, acquire the model from the target domain. So if I give the anal analogous example, let's say there is a baby, right? So let's say if, if it touches the fire, correct? And having any, any experience and it's going to touch the fire and have the costlier experience of touching the fire because it's going to burn its hand whereas let's say if there is an adult with as for the knowledge to the baby that don't touch it it's fire and, and you're going to burn your baby will baby will you know take that transferred model and then it will not touch a fire because we say there's a fire don't touch it correct so that's the idea of the transfer learning so here also let's say if we have multiple domains of resource allocation and some do domains when we have already a trained model already a learned system we can ex we can acquire those learned systems and models and knowledge into a target task where we are currently employing the resource allocation and we can instead of the training it here completely from a zero we can uh, exploit that learned model and then we can go ahead and ex execute the resource allocation so the advantage of is this the training needs generally the high computational capability right so if we this if we employ this distributed machine learning or transferred learning, we are importing the model from other domains, and we're not going to train them from zero unless it's required. If required, we'll train, but not always. So it's going to reduce the computational capability. It's going to reduce the computational capability at the next level, right? So that's why uh, that's why it's very advisable to transfer it. But sometimes uh, it may lead to the lower security that we have to overcome. That could be a blockchain's uh, you know, role to improve the security. Uh, so when we share, let's say, you know, tra model is transferred from target domain to source domain, and then we employ the resource allocation using the target domain. But sometimes that could be a you know, stealing of information uh, when we transfer it. So that could be that could be a bit you know, worrisome that we have to address it nicely, right? So generally, these decentralized systems they are uh, you know, they are intelligent decisions. Mm making systems at different granular levels to accelerate the learning through the parallel uh, learning, uh, parallel training process. So it requires splitting the data and uh, it, that requires splitting the data and model in an appropriate manner, right? 
So now if you look at these edge AI applications, they are also you know, substantial for sixth generation. So this is kind of a you know, part of the decentralized systems also. So where edge AI can uh, substantially cut down uh, the network computational capacity, I mean, uh, overhead on the computational capability and provide the better performance. So there are several use cases, uh, what people are exploring. This is also acting as one research domain. Uh, they are applying uh, several models such as you know, in that age learning process so that we can explore if you know, the detailed paper is given here, if someone is interested, it's a very decent paper, 2022, uh, someone is interested and all papers are you know, in a public domain, either they would be, you know, easily accessible at the i mean they are open access papers always uh, which i use in my talk so you can go ahead and uh, refer to this particular reference and then explore if you want so there are several uh, use cases and uh, for enabling the wireless communication with age training uh, that you can explore uh, one use case i'll explain here is a deep q network based joint resource allocation deep q network based joint resource allocation so here in the queue learning, how it works. So there is always an interaction between the environment and agent during the process, right? So it continuously observes this environment very nicely. And it will continuously sense, environment senses state, environment state is sensed by the agent. And then agent decides to choose the action based on a proper policy or a reward function. So let's say I am allocating a particular set of resources here maybe the frequencies or maybe the power location or something then after i allocate i will try to record my action and the corresponding reward or penalty so let's say when i you know the action state value function is is an evaluation of a policy uh, and usually a policy with larger state of action is you know is a better, better policy so when i get a larger reward here for a specific resource allocation action I'll, I mean, that's a better policy and I'll override with the you know, override that or, or an older policy and I may continue with that better policy by seeing it a larger reward. And it's continuously dynamic because it's sort of a queue learning, reinforcement learning. So it continuously senses the environment. There is a change in the environment. We can adjust the parameters so that the action with a high action state value is more likely to be selected. Right. And uh, the learning process of Q learning, I mean, the learning process of Q learning is a process of continuous iteration. Uh, so it goes, it, it's more, more, it's, it's, it's mostly suitable. I mean, it's, it's, it's very suitable for dynamic atmosphere, right? There is one more use case, which is known as uh, network slicing, correct? Which is known as network slicing. So which is, which is more you know, suitable for 5G and beyond networks. So network slicing, if you look at this, uh, what is the idea behind the network slicing is let's say if we have a larger network has to be deployed so one vendor may not be able to take that much of larger cost so let's say reliance would have an idea and i tell they want to deploy a network one vendor may not be able to take a larger uh, cost so what they do is they combinedly deploy the entire network uh, and then they may share the resources uh, by taking a cut or slices it's like an apple that's why let's say we got an apple we chop it into four parts right and then give it one to each kid and then kind of everyone is happy here right so the network infrastructure is kind of shared across those multiple vendors uh and these are called network slices so each one will get a slice and then on that slice they will transmit and they will they will provide the connection to the users right so finally if i you know brief uh, machine learning or deep learning for resource allocation so what's the resource generally the resource is nothing but the the channels power levels computer computational capabilities time slots frequencies which are analogous to channel uh, no, generally this these are resources which we have to distribute uh, evenly or fairly across the users right based on their different requirements right so the question is how to allocate suitable resources in a wireless network right so that's the major question what we face so generally, you know, people use uh, machine learning or deep learning along with the greedy algorithms, uh, auction theories, game theories. They are widely proposed to deal with the resource allocation problem, right? Which will, uh, no, 
which will be suitable for heterogeneous structures to accomplish higher quality of service requirements. Uh, generally, the radio resource in the power spectrum, time domain, they should be handled jointly because they are correlated with each other. Uh, whenever we provide a radio resources, uh, let's say we are allocating a spectrum power or maybe time slots or maybe special domain such as let's say beam forming I mean particular beam to a particular user so these are con to be considered jointly right so that joint allocation is uh, essential that's why the rapid response is essential because that joint allocation becomes dynamic based on the dynamic network scenario that's why our algorithms they should be uh, enough you know, quick to respond rapidly that's why the rapid response is essential and you need to sense the environment accurately that's why the accurate environment modeling is also essential along with this uh, with the self-adaptive capability right so these all are the points what we have uh, in the resource allocation problem finally if i brief the research opportunities in sixth generation are are firstly we will be exploring the terahertz communication modeling and different resource allocation methods uh, we need different multiplexing methodologies or technologies to enhance the spectrum utilization what we discussed we need efficient spectrum usage methods to increase the spectrum utilization uh, we need energy saving mechanisms because network becomes very complex and uh, the connection connectivity density is also very high so the power footprint has to be you know low so that's why the energy saving mechanisms are very uh, good uh, we need uh, so this is something interesting ai along with the blockchain that we will dedicatedly talk in the next session this is something really you know, attractive uh, because ai has certain disadvantages uh, blockchain has certain disadvantages whereas ai has a lot of advantages and blockchain has a lot of advantages when they come together they complement each other and they can correlate and you know, cooperate uh, you know, simultaneously helping each other to overcome the limitations of each other Right. That's what something uh, you know, which is very good uh, what we have right now. Uh, there are several routing schemes have to be developed to for the, for the effective routing. Uh, people are also looking at intelligent network slicing, what we just discussed. Capex opex reduction, that means capital uh, and operational expenditure reductions. Uh, that is mostly for the, the commercial deployment sort of things. Uh, what people are looking at and then if there are any application specific improvements that we have to look at that also people are looking at in this direction so that's what uh, that's what that's what i have for a day uh, and thank you very much for listening uh, and if you have any questions we are open for a discussion